episode 669. Book talk begins at 12 minutes and 8 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 669, Lonely Closets. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our fabulous patrons at Patreon. That's patreon.com slash craftlit. And our channel members on our YouTube channel, which is craftlit-channel. And this week we would like to highlight Madeline Daly, Janelle Serio, Mary Delaney, Carla Marshall, and Linda Hayden. Thank you so much for your support. We could not do this without you. Without you. I. Okay. The, the headaches keep coming and going. I have no idea. Is everybody on the planet right now in the Northern Hemisphere at least having really bad sinus headaches? Because I don't know if the headaches that I'm having are long COVID related or just life. This is the problem trying to come out of the other side of a chronic illness is trying to figure out what's just normal. <laughs> like, what's just normal aging? Life is a mystery. So yeah, if you have any insights on the uh, sinus headache thing, let me know. You can always call at 206-350-1642. You can email heather at craftlet.com. You can leave a comment in the show notes at craftlit.com or libsyn.com or uh, on YouTube. YouTube appears to be the easiest place to leave comments. I've been really struggling with realizing just how different the world is now, technologically wise, between now and when we started Craftlit, when it was so easy to comment. I know I mentioned this early on in Emma. I've, I have been trying to get promos from other podcasts and it's harder now to do that everybody's you know sponsored and restricted and promos are much more salesy instead of quirky and and it's it's just hard but the happy news is Aaron Ziegler is almost done with much ado and I could not be happier I'm having so much fun listening to Chop Bard's much ado I cannot recommend it enough it's one of my favorite Shakespeare plays to begin with. It's probably the one that I know the best outside of Hamlet. And um, ah, it's just lovely. All right. Over on the YouTube channel, we also have Bleak House now complete. All of that is up in the membership area. And I think Eric said that he's going to put Dorian Gray up next. So if that is a premium book that you missed before, it's up at Patreon, and you'll be able to get it over on the YouTube channel as well. On August 25th, we're going to be doing the live stream. This is going to be the Emma Q&A and live stream where I will be talking to listener Rebecca. And at least one other person is coming on to talk about Emma as well. If you have questions about Jane Austen, about Emma, about parts of the story, or just comments that you want to make, please send those in. Uh, you can do that again, heather at craftlit.com, or you can call 206-350-1642. If you call, then we can play the voicemail during the live stream and everybody can hear your, your question or your comment. But yeah, I'm looking forward to this. We haven't done this before, so. So yay. Thursday the 29th will be the Patreon book party, which will be hosted over on our Discord server. Make sure you hop on that Discord server in advance. If you are a patron or if you are using the app or you are a YouTube channel member, please contact us directly and we will get you hooked up on 
the Discord server so that you too can uh, join in. We now have both an RPG channel for people to talk RPG games, and we also have uh, a crafting channel so people can just share stuff. And this, by the way, this is not Instagram. This is us. This is, I'm just taking a snapshot of this. It's a thing I'm working on. I'm really proud of it. So no pressure, no, you only live once, fear of missing out, garbage. This is not a curated life. This is just us doing our stuff and wanting to share it with each other. And I am so glad. I think it was Lily in the Shadows who recommended doing that. And I really appreciate that. That was smart. Very, very happy to make that happen. Oh, and the 29th is going to be our our book party for the Lore Gatherers. This is written by Jonathan Uffelman. And Jonathan will be joining us. So if you want to talk to an author uh, or want to talk to Jonathan as being a really great actor, that would be fine. I'll also make sure I get Jonathan to come and read some of his text so that you can hear his fabulous voice. So I'm looking forward to that as well. So this week's episode is named Lonely Closets. And the reason is because I stumbled on a, a TED Talk that I... I haven't watched a lot of TED Talks recently. I don't know why, because I usually like them. But this one is by Molly K, M O L L I E K A Y E. And this is what the screenshot looks like if you are watching YouTube. If you are not watching YouTube, we will have a screenshot of that uh, that video in the show notes for you so that you can take a, a glance at how she's dressed. Her whole thesis for her TED Talk is especially because of the pandemic, but but also just in general, it started before the pandemic. We get separated and isolated and it's it's too easy to become lonely. And then because we don't really have any third spaces anymore, there's no, like nobody's all going to the hairdressers to get their hair done, at least in the white community. We have completely lost that. Same thing with manicures, pedicures. Most people are going by themselves. I rarely in the last, I don't know, 10 years have ever seen people who are going together. Usually if I see that it's a bridal party, it's like the group of girls who are there all all getting their manicures at the same time. It, it's hard to find casual ways to just talk to people and feel less isolated. And she decided that every Tuesday she was going to get herself all dolled up in her one of her 1950s dresses, like vintage dresses, hat, gloves, handbag, the whole bit, and go out in public, like make herself go out and do things. The reason I bring it up is because it reminded me of early in the aughts when you know, post 9-11 in New York City, people were knitting and crocheting on the trains like as a form of mental health. And I remember that sparking a lot of conversations because people did those skill sets so differently depending on what country they were born in and who they learned from. And it just gave people an open door to say something nice. And I I don't think I ever had somebody not say something nice. And she talks about having originally done this at a, a friend's, had a vintage fair. And so she was working there in a, you know, white, dress with the big pink polka dots, petticoats, the whole bit, and was walking back to her car afterwards. And people were chasing after her just to tell her how much they enjoyed just the fact that she did that, that she fully committed to the the bit. And it got her thinking. And so there, there are days, she says, where she really doesn't want to do it, but she makes herself do it anyway. And it's been a good thing. And I thought about us knitting in public and embroidering in public and crocheting in public and sketching in public, that doing it in public may be scary because people are going to come and talk to you. But I don't think there's a reason to be scared. If you are socially anxious, I actually think that certainly what my kids have learned is having something like that, whether it's, you know, a pencil in your hand and you're sketching or knitting or crocheting or spinning, you know, with a drop spindle, whatever. Yes, that may invite somebody's comment, but we're not in middle school anymore. (laughs) So thank God. So nobody's comments are snarky. They are, if people want to be snarky about it, they're just going to say something to a friend. You'll never hear them. But 
if people are going to talk to you, they're going to talk to you because they're curious or oh, my grandmother used to do that. I love that. Or oh, I wish I could do that. And then you can, you know, be a pusher. I mean, enabler and teach them how to knit or crochet or whatever. It was a nice reminder that there are pleasant ways to casually be neighborly, which seems to be kind of a theme right now in, in, uh, in the United States that we're starting to remember what it's nice like to feel like you're part of a larger, happier community. And, uh, and boy, is that a, a welcome change. So this, I thought this video was well-timed and, and I hope you go watch her. She's really, she's a hoot and she's performative. She's doing her, her bit. So a link to that will be in the show notes and below if you are on YouTube. And then I also got this week, I was very excited to get this from listener Melanie. Melanie wrote in exclamation point text, fish skin. She wrote, here's an example of the saying, everything old is new again. The use of fish skin for complex wound healing is cutting edge these days. And then linked out to a, a site, wounds, W-O-U-N-D-S dash U-K dot com. And it said, use of acellular fish skin grafts in wound healing, a literature review. So you can go read about this if you want. That is just so cool. I love that. I did not go read about it because I was afraid that day my brain would break, but oh, I'm so excited. So thank you, Melanie. Melanie also wrote that she's enjoying Emma uh, and said, I've spent many, many, many hours with Craftlet while knitting and blocking out noise from my children. Melanie, I feel you. I think, I think many of us, many of us have been there. Many of us have done that. And, and if I can help in any way, I am very, very happy to. Okay. So today's chapter we are doing volume three, chapter five, or legit chapter 41. And this chapter, remember how at the end of last week, when Emma and Harriet were having their conversation about, oh, Harriet has decided she doesn't want to marry, and Emma's kind of horrified, and oh my gosh, are you doing this for to try and emulate me or other reasons? They had that whole conversation, and I said it was a short chapter, but I really didn't want to add another chapter to last week's episode because there was a tonal shift. It's not just a tonal shift. It's almost a point of view shift. We have Austin's free indirect style almost exclusively used with Emma. We've seen moments where it's gotten into other people's voices. This chapter isn't exactly Emma style, free indirect style. And it's not exactly a point of view chapter the way I think we've come to think of point of view chapters, usually as, as first person or a third person limited where you are usually seeing through the eyes of one character, even though the narrator is third person. Harry Potter, I think, is third person limited because it's it's all stuff that happens to and around Hen Harry. You don't ever read anything from anybody else's point of view. He has to have been there for you to know that part of the the story. This is not that. This is subtly different. And it's all from Mr. Knightley's point of view. So we know Mr. Knightley has not exactly liked Frank Churchill. And this week, we start to get fed the whys behind some of the hints as to the whys behind why Knightley is, is not, I'm saying Knightley, Mr. Knightley is not a fan. So that's, that's part of why it has to be from sort of his point of view. Some things to know before we listen to the chapter. Don't forget that mother-in-law, the way that it's been used in this book, is often Frank Churchill talking about Miss, Mrs. Weston, that it's his, his stepmother. It's his mother by law, but not a mother-in-law the way we think of it these days. Intelligence, we tend to think of it as smarts or spycraft, military intelligence kind of thing. The usage early on in this chapter, the usage of intelligence is closer to the spycraft thing. It's like sympathetic knowledge going back and forth between two people. There's, an in, there's a symptom of an intelligence that you can see going on between two people. There is a quote from a poet who we've mentioned before on the podcast, and I think Maya Daguerre corrected my pronunciation 
Cooper, spelled C-O-W-P-E-R, but pronounced Cooper, William Cooper. He's the man originally responsible for writing the lyrics to Amazing Grace. He has a fascinating history and a heartbreaking one in some respects. I'm linking out to two videos, one that's just a, a lightweight, short William Cooper in his own words, and that comes from the Cooper and Newton Museum. Um, Newton was his partner in hymn writing and an excellent friend. I've got another video that I'm sharing with you, which is a a professor from uh, Seattle, I think. And it's just him giving a talk at at the university bookstore. And it's nine years old. There is zero production value. It is just him reading. He's charming. He's kindly old professor the way that you would like your kindly old professors to be with just the the wink and a nod, but also the ability to get kind of choked up when the poems are hard. And sometimes they are hard. But one of the things that I really, really liked learning about Cooper is I knew he was one of Jane Austen's favorite poets. I didn't know why. Part of it is because he has a very gentle touch to his humor, but the humor is there and not hidden. It's not lurking somewhere. It's it's there. You know it's there. It's supposed to be there. But he also, uh, aside from the hymns that he wrote, he's very famous for a book called The Task, which started as him complaining to a housekeeper. They were besties, not married, never a hint of any hanky-panky going on. It was just they were good for each other and they were they were together for over 20 years. He was complaining one night that he didn't have anything to write about. And she said, okay, why don't you write about the couch? And he said, okay, and started writing about the couch. And that turned into like this four volume book, The Task, which was largely an abolitionist text. Newton knew he was besties with as well, who he wrote the hymns with, had been a slave trader and became an abolitionist. So you know that guy's going to be pretty fervent uh, in his abolition and his belief that slavery should end. Cooper was right there with him. And so a lot of the writing is about freedom and justice, but also about heart and appreciating what you've got. He's a good poet for today. And he's remarkably accessible, but I am going to read to you clip, which is the clip that Knightley is going to refer to. Knightley is going to say, well, and this is the free and direct part, nor could he avoid observations, which unless it were like Cooper and his fire at twilight, myself creating what I saw, that's the quote, brought him yet stronger suspicion of there being a something. This is between Frank Churchill and somebody else, not Emma. This is where that comes from. That comes from uh, book four of the task. Me oft has fantasy ludicrous and wild, soothed with a waking dream of houses, towers, trees, churches, and strange visages expressed in the red cinders, while with pouring eye, I gazed, myself creating what I saw. And it's interesting that Jane Austen uses this little reference to that larger, that small part of a much larger poem, because dreams and creating what you see actually shows up in a minute. We're going to talk about it then. But I wanted to give you that highlight of this is a quote, and this is nightly using the quote, just so when it pops up, you you pay attention to how careful he is trying to be to not be Emma, to not see things that don't exist and think that they are fact, like between two people like Harriet and Elton, that kind of thing. Uh, Just a reminder that having a carriage is expensive. Having a carriage with horses is crazy expensive. And so if somebody at this time period was able to start setting up to own their own carriage and team or single horse, if it was a small enough carriage, it would have been about a thousand a thousand pounds at the time, just getting all of the pieces together and the maintenance and everything. So people were not just going to do this when they 
made a few bucks. This would be an indication that you were definitely rising in the ranks of financial comparison between you and the other people in your neighborhood and area. It turns out that at the beginning of the 19th century, circular tables were all the rage. I am going out on a limb here. I do not know if this is true, but it seems to me, timing wise, that the romantic movement and kind of the epic romance, the, the rise of Sir Walter Scott and Evangeline and all the, the kind of King Arthur tropes that were getting spread around at the time of and post-French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité, that égalité thing was big, obviously not for everybody, but it was definitely on people's minds. So circular tables, the kind that Jefferson talked about wanting to have as president because he didn't want anybody being the head of the table or the foot of the table for that matter, they were becoming very popular. They obviously also take up a lot more space than the kind of table that is referred to also in this chapter, which is a Pembroke table. We've talked about these before as card tables. When I was growing up, they were drop leaf tables. And in fact, we have a couple of pictures of different Regency era Pembroke tables for you to see. There's nothing particularly special about them except that you can make them bigger by flipping the, the drop leaves up or lower them and having a, a small table. A Pembroke table would still be quite small for Emma and her father to eat at, but it would be just fine for several people to play cards around. So that's, that's more the size comparison thing. You can fit more at the, the round table. It's going to take up more space. And I mentioned that there was going to be kind of a prolonged section in today's chapter about dreams. And I just wanted to point out that this book is being written right after Coleridge wrote and published Kubla Khan. So this idea of dreams and the importance of dreams and the connection between dream and reality was a topic of conversation. Because Mr. Weston is going to start talking kind of philosophically about dreams. And I found it before I really put the pieces together, I found that kind of odd that would be coming out of his mouth. I would have expected it kind of more out of Harriet, but it makes perfect sense that this is kind of a, a pop psychology topic at the time. And Mr. Weston would have heard stuff. And that, that to me made a lot of sense. That rang true. You'll hear a reference to a box of letters. These were letters that were often just printed on thick paper stock. Sometimes they were engraved or burned into pieces of wood or bone. You get kind of a scrimshaw thing going on. There were all sorts of ways that these things could be made, but they were used for exactly what you would imagine they were. They were to help kids learn how to read and manipulate words. Not a surprise. But also you could make kind of a proto scrabble and, you know, just toss letters or boggle toss letters out and see how many words people can come up with. This was a thing that was done. And I did not know that. And I think it's so cool. <laughs> and it just made me very happy. So when they're talking about a box of letters, they're not talking about folded letters that have been handwritten by somebody and sent. They're talking about an actual box with a lot of letters printed on some kind of substance, probably, probably thick cardstock type paper. When you hear the word gallantry used by Knightley late in the chapter, I just want to put this quote from Byron's Don Juan into your head. And it is Don Juan. Just, I'm not making the mistake of not being able to pronounce Juan. It only scans if you say Don Juan. If you say Don Juan, it, it doesn't. So it's come up before, I think back when we did Frankenstein, and I just realized, oh, it's been a while since I've mentioned that. So in Don Juan, there was a line what men call gallantry and God's adultery is much more common where the climate's sultry. So this kind of gallantry is the way it's being used by Knightley. It's like air quotes. It's fake. It's not chivalrous. It's not kind. It's being gallant without actually being a good guy. And that is it. Let's listen to chapter 41. That's volume three, book five of Jane Austen's Emma. 
If you are listening to your own version of the book, please fast wind to 41 minutes and two seconds. All right, here we go. Volume 3, Chapter 5 In this state of schemes and hopes and connivance, June opened upon Hartfield. To Highbury in general it brought no material change. The Eltons were still talking of a visit from the Sucklings, and of the use to be made of their barouche landau, and Jane Fairfax was still at her grandmother's. And as the return of the Campbells from Ireland was again delayed, and August, instead of midsummer, fixed for it, she was likely to remain there full two months longer provided at least she were able to defeat Mrs. Elton's activity in her service, and save herself from being hurried into a delightful situation against her will. Mr. Knightley, who for some reason best known to himself, had certainly taken an early dislike to Frank Churchill, was only growing to dislike him more. He began to suspect him of some double dealing in his pursuit of Emma. That Emma was his object appeared indisputable, everything declared it, his own attentions, his father's hints, his mother-in-law's guarded silence. It was all in unison. Words, conduct, discretion, and indiscretion told the same story. But while so many were devoting him to Emma, and Emma herself making him over to Harriet, Mr. Knightley began to suspect him of some inclination to trifle with Jane Fairfax. He could not understand it but there were symptoms of intelligence between them, he thought so at least, symptoms of admiration on his side, which, having once observed, he could not persuade himself to think entirely void of meaning, however he might wish to escape any of Emma's errors of imagination. She was not present when the suspicion first arose. He was dining with the Randalls family, and Jane at the Eltons, and he had seen a look, more than a single look at Miss Fairfax, which from the admirer of Miss Woodhouse seemed somewhat out of place. When he was again in their company, he could not help remembering what he had seen, nor could he avoid observations which, unless it were like Cowper and his fire at twilight, myself creating what I saw, brought him yet stronger suspicion of there being a something of private liking, of private understanding even, between Frank Churchill and Jane. He walked up one day after dinner, as he very often did, to spend his evening at Hartfield. Emma and Harriet were going to walk, he joined them, and on returning they fell in with a larger party, who like themselves judged it wisest to take their exercise early, as the weather threatened rain. Mr. and Mrs. Weston and their son, Miss Bates and her niece, who had accidentally met— they all united, and on reaching Hartfield Gates, Emma, who knew it was exactly the sort of visiting that would be welcome to her father, pressed them all to go in and drink tea with him. The Randalls' party agreed to it immediately, and after a pretty long speech from Miss Bates, which few persons listened to, she also found it possible to accept dear Miss Woodhouse's most obliging invitation. As they were turning into the grounds, Mr. Perry passed by on horseback. The gentleman spoke of his horse. By the by, said Frank Churchill to Mrs. Weston presently. What became of Mr. Perry's plan of setting up his carriage? Mrs. Weston looked surprised, and said, I did not know that he ever had any such plan. Nay, I had it from you. You wrote me word of it three months ago. Me? Impossible. Indeed you did. I remember it perfectly. You mentioned it as what was certainly to be very soon. Mrs. Perry had told somebody, and was extremely happy about it. It was owing to her persuasion, as she thought his being out in bad weather did him a great deal of harm. You must remember it now. Upon my word, I never heard of it till this moment. Never? Really never? Bless me, how could it be? Then I must have dreamt it. But I was completely persuaded. Miss Smith, you walk as if you were tired. You will not be sorry to find yourself at home. What is this? What is this? cried Mr. Weston. About Perry in a carriage? Is Perry going to set up his carriage, Frank? I am glad he can afford it. You had it from himself, had you? No, sir, replied his son, laughing. I seem to have had it from nobody. Very odd. I really was persuaded of Mrs. Weston's having mentioned it in one of her letters to Enscombe many weeks ago, with all these particulars. But as she declares she never heard a syllable of it before, of course it must have been a dream— I am a great dreamer. I dream of everybody at Highbury when I am away, and when I have gone through my particular friends, then I begin dreaming of Mr. and Mrs. Perry. It is odd, though, observed his father, that you should have had such a regular connected dream about people whom it was not very likely you should be thinking of at Enscombe. 
Perry's setting up his carriage, and his wife's persuading him to it, out of care for his health. Just what will happen, I have no doubt, some time or other, only a little premature. What an air of probability sometimes runs through a dream, and at others what a heap of absurdities it is. Well, Frank, your dream certainly shows that Highbury is in your thoughts when you are absent. Emma, you are a great dreamer, I think. Emma was out of hearing. She had hurried on before her guests to prepare her father for their appearance, and was beyond the reach of Mr. Weston's hint. "'Why, to own the truth!' cried Miss Bates, who had been trying in vain to be heard the last two minutes. "'If I must speak on this subject, there is no denying that Mr. Frank Churchill might have—I do not mean to say he did not dream it. I am sure I have sometimes the oddest dreams in the world. But if I am questioned about it, I must acknowledge that there was such an idea last spring, for Mrs. Perry herself mentioned it to my mother, and the Coles knew of it as well as ourselves. And it was quite a secret, known to nobody else, and only thought of about three days ago. Mrs. Perry was very anxious that he should have a carriage, and came to my mother in great spirits one morning, because she thought she had prevailed. "'Jane, don't you remember Grandmamma's telling us of it when we got home? I forget where we had been walking to. Very likely to Randall's. Yes, I think it was to Randall's. Mrs. Perry was always particularly fond of my mother. Indeed, I do not know who is not. And she had mentioned it to her in confidence. She had no objection to her telling us, of course, but it was not to go beyond. And from that day to this, I never mentioned it to a soul that I know of. At the same time, I will not positively answer for my never having dropped a hint, because I know I do sometimes pop out a thing before I am aware. I am a talker, you know. I am rather a talker, and now and then I have let a thing escape me which I should not. I am not like Jane. I wish I were. I will answer for it. She never betrayed the least thing in the world. Where is she? Oh, just behind. Perfectly remember Mrs. Perry's coming. Extraordinary dream indeed. They were entering the hall. Mr. Knightley's eyes had preceded Miss Bates's in a glance at Jane. From Frank Churchill's face, where he thought he saw confusion suppressed or laughed away, he had involuntarily turned to hers, but she was indeed behind and too busy with her shawl. Mr. Weston had walked in. The other two gentlemen waited at the door to let her pass. Mr. Knightley suspected in Frank Churchill the determination of catching her eye. He seemed watching her intently. In vain, however, if it were so, Jane passed between them into the hall, and looked at neither. There was no time for farther remark or explanation. The dream must be borne with, and Mr. Knightley must take his seat with the rest round the large modern circular table which Emma had introduced at Hartfield, and which none but Emma could have had power to place there and persuade her father to use, instead of the small-sized Pembroke on which two of his daily meals had, for forty years, been crowded. Tea passed pleasantly, but nobody seemed in a hurry to move. "'Miss Woodhouse,' said Frank Churchill, after examining a table behind him, which he could reach as he sat, "'Have your nephews taken away their alphabets, their box of letters? It used to stand here. Where is it? This is a sort of dull-looking evening that ought to be treated rather as winter than summer. We had great amusement with those letters one morning. I want to puzzle you again.' Emma was pleased with the thought, and producing the box, the table was quickly scattered over with alphabets, which no one seemed so much disposed to employ as their two selves. They were rapidly forming words for each other, or for anybody else who would be puzzled. The quietness of the game made it particularly eligible for Mr. Woodhouse, who had often been distressed by the more animated sort, which Mr. Weston had occasionally introduced, and who now sat happily occupied in lamenting, with tender melancholy, over the departure of the poor little boys, or in fondly pointing out, as he took up any stray letter near him, how beautifully Emma had written it. Frank Churchill placed a word before Miss Fairfax. She gave a slight glance round the table and applied herself to it. Frank was next to Emma, Jane opposite to them, and Mr. Knightley so placed as to see them all, and it was his object to see as much as he could, with as little apparent observation. The word was discovered, and with a faint smile pushed away. If meant to be immediately mixed with the others, and buried from sight, she should have looked on the table instead of looking just across, for it was not mixed, and Harriet, eager after every fresh word, and finding out none, directly took it up, and fell to work. She was sitting by Mr. Knightley, and turned to him for help. The word was blunder, and as Harriet exultingly proclaimed it, there was a blush on Jane's cheek which gave it a meaning not otherwise ostensible. Mr. Knightley connected it with the dream, but how it could all be was beyond his comprehension. How the delicacy, the discretion of his favourite could have been so lain asleep. He feared there must be some decided involvement. Disingenuousness and double-dealing seemed to meet him at every turn. These letters were but the vehicle for gallantry and trick. 
It was child's play chosen to conceal a deeper game on Frank Churchill's part. With great indignation did he continue to observe him, with great alarm and distrust to observe also his two blinded companions. He saw a short word prepared for Emma, and given to her with a look sly and demure. He saw that Emma had soon made it out, and found it highly entertaining, though it was something which she judged it proper to appear to censure, for she said, "'Nonsense! For shame!' He heard Frank Churchill next say, with a glance towards Jane, "'I will give it to her, shall I?' and as clearly heard Emma opposing it with eager, laughing warmth. "'No, no, you must not! You shall not, indeed!' It was done, however. This gallant young man, who seemed to love without feeling, and to recommend himself without complacence, directly handed over the word to Miss Fairfax, and with a particular degree of sedate civility entreated her to study it. Mr. Knightley's excessive curiosity to know what this word might be made him seize every possible moment for darting his eye towards it, and it was not long before he saw it to be Dixon. Jane Fairfax's perception seemed to accompany his. Her comprehension was certainly more equal to the covert meaning, the superior intelligence of those five letters so arranged. She was evidently displeased, looked up, and seeing herself watched, blushed more deeply than he had ever perceived her, and saying only— I did not know that proper names were allowed, pushed away the letters with an even angry spirit, and looked resolved to be engaged by no other word that could be offered. Her face was averted from those who had made the attack, and turned towards her aunt. "'Ay, very true, my dear,' cried the latter, though Jane had not spoken a word. "'I was just going to say the same thing. It is time for us to be going indeed. The evening is closing in, and Grandmamma will be looking for us. My dear sir, you are too obliging. We really must wish you good-night.' Jane's alertness in moving proved her as ready as her aunt had preconceived. She was immediately up, and wanting to quit the table, but so many were also moving that she could not get away, and Mr. Knightley thought he saw another collection of letters anxiously pushed towards her, and resolutely swept away by her unexamined. She was afterwards looking for her shawl. Frank Churchill was looking also. It was growing dusk, and the room was in confusion. How they parted, Mr. Knightley could not tell. He remained at Hartfield after all the rest, his thoughts full of what he had seen, so full that when the candles came to assist his observations, he must, yes, he certainly must, as a friend, an anxious friend, give Emma some hint, ask her some question. He could not see her in a situation of such danger, without trying to preserve her. It was his duty. "'Pray, Emma,' said he, "'may I ask in what lay the great amusement, the poignant sting of the last word given to you and Miss Fairfax?' I saw the word, and am curious to know how it could be so very entertaining to the one, and so very distressing to the other. Emma was extremely confused. She could not endure to give him the true explanation, for though her suspicions were by no means removed, she was really ashamed of having ever imparted them. Oh, she cried in evident embarrassment, it all meant nothing, a mere joke among ourselves. The joke, he replied gravely, seemed confined to you and Mr. Churchill. He had hoped she would speak again, but she did not. She would rather busy herself about anything than speak. He sat a little while in doubt. A variety of evils crossed his mind. Interference, fruitless interference. Emma's confusion and the acknowledged intimacy seemed to declare her affection engaged. Yet he would speak. He owed it to her, to risk anything that might be involved in an unwelcome interference, rather than her welfare, to encounter anything rather than the remembrance of neglect in such a cause. "'My dear Emma,' said he at last, with earnest kindness, "'do you think you perfectly understand the degree of acquaintance between the gentleman and lady we have been speaking of?' "'Between Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Fairfax? Oh, yes, perfectly. Why do you make a doubt of it?' "'Have you never at any time had reason to think that he admired her, or that she admired him?' "'Never, never!' she cried with the most open eagerness. Never for the twentieth part of a moment did such an idea occur to me. And how could it possibly come into your head? I have lately imagined that I saw symptoms of attachment between them, certain expressive looks which I did not believe meant to be public. Oh, you amuse me excessively. I am delighted to find that you can vouchsafe to let your imagination wander. But it will not do. Very sorry to check you in your first essay, but indeed it will not do. There is no admiration between them, I do assure you. 
and the appearances which have caught you have arisen from some peculiar circumstances, feelings rather of a totally different nature. It is impossible exactly to explain. There is a good deal of nonsense in it, but the part which is capable of being communicated, which is sense, is that they are as far from any attachment or admiration for one another as any two beings in the world can be. That is, I presume it to be so on her side, and I can answer for its being so on his. I will answer for the gentleman's indifference. She spoke with a confidence which staggered, with a satisfaction which silenced Mr. Knightley. She was in gay spirits, and would have prolonged the conversation, wanting to hear the particulars of his suspicions, every look described, and all the wares and hows of a circumstance which highly entertained her, but his gaiety did not meet hers. He found he could not be useful, and his feelings were too much irritated for talking." That he might not be irritated into an absolute fever, by the fire which Mr. Woodhouse's tender habits required almost every evening throughout the year, he soon afterwards took a hasty leave, and walked home to the coolness and solitude of Donwell Abbey. End of chapter 5 Okay, so we get a little Mr. Knightley viewpoint here. I love, I love that at the beginning, he's all, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be accused of having too big an imagination like Emma. She does all this other stuff, but I'm going to make sure that I am not just imagining things. And that's the the Cooper quote. But I I love that we needed to see this because Jane Austen has done too good a job at hiding information from us. And legitimately, we shouldn't have noticed this because Emma wouldn't have noticed this. But this particular moment where Frank Churchill makes a mistake actually several but the the first one is him talking about mr perry's carriage and the only person he could have heard that from would have been jane fairfax because he doesn't write letters back and forth with miss bates so now we know there has been some kind of correspondence going between the two of them and it has been secret and when Frank realizes he has made this mistake and brought up a subject that he should not know about, and he has to start backpedaling, it is Miss Bates who comes to his rescue accidentally. Because even though she divulges that nobody except her and Jane Fairfax had heard this about the Perrys uh, setting up a carriage, because they had been told it in confidence. And so Miss Bates was actually really keeping that to herself. Jane happened to be there when she found out. She immediately goes into her, oh, did I do that? Oh, I must have done that. I talk a lot. Do you know I talk a lot? I mean, one, that's the benefit of having a Bates around you. But two, it's her purpose in the book to really throw a, a mirror up to a lot of characters. But it's also her purpose in the book to, I think, for a modern reader to see that when we say it takes all kinds or it takes a village, that this is part of that. You, everybody's going to have something that's annoying about them. I'm looking at myself right now as I'm saying this. And that's just a fact about everyone. But sometimes those annoying things wind up being really useful. People don't usually do stuff over and over again because they're stupid. There are usually reasons. And while Miss Bates cannot seem to stop herself from talking, her good heart has come to the rescue a couple times. And, and this is the, the latest one. And this one is for Frank slash Jane. And it makes it kind of impossible for Knightley to go any further with his supposition that something nefarious is going on until the event happens that Emma is there for. And that is the, the game, the, the kind of Scrabble-like game playing the letter tiles, the box of letters. And actually, in this chapter, as I was looking at it again, it looks like these are letters that Emma has written onto cardstock and cut apart for her nephews. But it was also a thing that you could purchase printed printed letters for kids to play with, and, and adults too, as we've seen here. This kind of sly wordplay is so Jane Austen. She just loves this. It reminds me of when I, when I met uh, a guy who I wound up dating for two years we were at a party and he, I said something and he, he joked and said, so are you a foe? And I said, foe, F-O-E or F-A-U-X. And that was it. He 
that was why he dated me. I am convinced was just that that one moment of wordplay because he is a writer. I have a thing for writers, clearly. But Frank's word blunder, I thought was such an interesting choice as kind of an apology to Jane Fairfax. Like, I know I stuck my foot in it, but also that's the word that Knightley sees. So double blunder, double fault. Oops. The fact that Frank Churchill also uses the word Dixon is kind of a jerk move. Now, it's harder for us to know exactly what's going on. Like, is Frank just jealous and thinking that Jane Fairfax, like Emma does, is after or was after Mr. Dixon? Or is he referring to the fact that Jane Fairfax's best friend has married Mr. Dixon and there's this new conversation about them not coming back from Ireland yet. They're going to stay another three months. It's hard to know, but it's nice that Jane Austen adds that so that we're still kind of starting on the wrong foot. We're not entirely sure yet what's going on. And Knightley, too, is unsure. He certainly knows that Emma doesn't think that this is a thing. And by the end of this chapter, she has waved him off so completely that even though she's having fun talking about how there could not be possibly be anything between Frank and Jane Fairfax, Knightley is really made uncomfortable by all of this and, and cannot stay to have any kind of fun chit chat about this topic. He just has to get out of there. Even sitting and talking to Mr. Woodhouse calmly and quietly is too much for him. And I get that. We've all been there, tired and done. Yeah. Especially when the conversation is going in a way that is either really not of interest to you or not nice. Good reasons to leave. I also love that the description of Emma talking to Knightley about this at the end was she spoke with a confidence which staggered, with a satisfaction which silenced Mr. Knightley. Oh my God, I just love Jane Austen. She doesn't use hyperbolic words very often. And her clarity of mind, she knows what she knows and she knows it for realsies, is so strong that it staggers Mr. Knightley. Is just such a great look to that whole thing and really does give credit to the fact that Emma and Knightley are, age disparity aside, much more on the same level when it comes to just being people with each other. That's marvelous. And that is where we're going to end it this week. Because again, next week, tone shift. So more to come, but not there yet. And don't forget to write in about uh, any questions or comments that you have to share with the world about Emma. Please, please, please do. Also, raffle book, heirloom knitting. This is Heirloom Knitting by Sharon Miller, and this is going to be the raffle for uh, the raffle prize for August. If you are interested in entering the raffle, please take a look at the show notes, and there will be a link to Rafflecopter, and you can follow that and sign up there. Heather from the future. Hi, I just finished recording this, and then I got a voicemail from Amy in Seattle, and I thought it was a voicemail that made sense to play for you here. And that is because I did not explain Taylor tax very well last week. <laughs> uh, however, found uh, the video that I learned it from this, this technique. And so if you're watching on YouTube, you will be able to see that video. And if you are watching on YouTube, you will be able to see what Amy is talking about too, because I found a d video demonstrating that as well. If you are listening on just a podcast, you will be able to go to the video links so that you too can watch other people's genius. All right, here's Amy. Hi, Heather. It's Amy in Seattle, and I'm listening to episode 668. I just had to pause it and call in listening to you talk about the tailoring methods that you know, used to be common knowledge for people who were well-trained in sewing and always lost over the years. And I got totally lost when you were describing <laughs> what to do, but my auditory um, 
learning skills aren't uh, aren't quite up to snuff. I would love to see it demonstrated. Um, but it made me think about, um, as you know, and as some of the Thursday night folks know, I usually go every week to a warehouse down in South Seattle and help build tiny homes for our homeless neighbors. And I've been doing it for a couple years now. And I've worked up to the um, level of being a team lead, which means that when I'm there and there are folks who are new to the process who come in and help build, we have a few dozen people every day in there working on these homes. I'm often working with young people, teenagers and 20 something and almost everyone who comes in has zero construction experience, zero building experience like I did when I first started. But what's really cool um, made me think of uh, from what you were saying is I get to geek out a little bit with them because we have all these great modern tools there. We've gotten um, battery operated nail guns and saws of every color, you know, chop saws and band saws and table saws and all of those things and all these automated tools. But the, I think the coolest tool we have is the simple chalk line. For those aren't, who aren't familiar with it, the chalk line is just a small container. It's either metal or plastic and it's filled with blue powdered chalk, just like dressmaker's chalk. And there's a spool of twine in there, and you get a little shape, and you stretch the twine out, and you hold it taut at either end, and you give it a snap, and you've got a blue chalk line that you can use to guide whatever you're doing. You use it to guide nails into studs or into floor joints. And when I've got these young folks who have no experience in building or construction, I usually take a few minutes and say, hey, I want to geek out a little bit here and tell you about this. This is a tool that humans have been using for literally, literally thousands of years, and no one's been able to improve upon it. They've tried. We have laser lines and things like that, but lasers can shift. They can be knocked askew. They can be, they can wiggle. Um, but this, once you snap the line, the line is there and it can't be moved. And between that and a plumb line, which we don't use, but it's a similar idea. You know, gravity is always the same, and a laser level can be not. Um, I just, what's really cool is, like, telling these young folks about the chalk line, the history of it, the fact that this is no different from the ones that they were using, you know, a 1,000 years B.C. Um, and about 50% of them, you just see their eyes widen and they go, whoa, that's really cool. Um it just reminded me that some of those old technologies just cannot be improved upon, and I love, love passing that on. So thank you for sharing. I um, I learned some of those tricks from my mom about sewing when I was a kid, and, of course, they've all just flown right out of my head, and I just love all the neat, cool, old, everything old is new again stuff that you share with us. Have a good day. Bye. All right. I think that's it. You take care of yourself. Talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlet channel and from there you can get links out to all of the social media all of the places that craftlet lives it's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff all the good stuff and i keep forgetting to mention we also have a facebook group with the loveliest group of people as you might imagine they're just awesome makers and readers and people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.